Next Sunday is the Miracle Offering kickoff, so make sure uh, you, you take advantage of that and help us even giving Tuesdays this week, and you can give that way as well online, and so make sure that uh, you pray about what the Lord would have you to do. And again, the Christmas store is this Saturday. It is here, people. And so uh, we want to bless 240 kids this Saturday. Yeah, that's amazing uh, for this, uh, this Christmas store. And so uh, be sure you volunteer because there, there's nothing like giving back into the community and knowing that you're bringing joy to homes and families at this time of the year, and there's something for everybody to be able to serve, so make sure uh, you help us with that. It's Christmas time in the city. ring a right? I may know I've been listening to a lot of Christmas music lately, but we're going to talk about hope uh, this month, and uh, there's nothing like Christmas to bring hope to our world, to our lives. We're going to start talking about it today and through the rest of this month, so make sure you're here because uh, the Christmas story just brings hope. Um, as a matter of fact, it starts off, the Christmas story, with the topic of fear, uh, of how, and we'll see this in a moment, where the angels would say, hey, you don't have to be afraid. Fear not. Don't be fearful. And, and I think the reason they say that is because it's natural for many of us to fear, to be afraid. And maybe today you fear the economy and the future. Maybe you fear uh, how your kids are going to turn out because nobody gave you a manual, you know. Uh, the easy part was having them. I mean, agree to that. It's, it's, the, it's the after part that's, that's challenging and difficult. And, and, and all, of, all of life, maybe you just were with in-laws that you don't like. Can we be honest in church the, today, uh, this week? And maybe you got to see them again here in just a few weeks and, and different things like that. I don't know what it is for you, but let me just ask you today, how many have fear of maybe some different things, like heights. That's one of mine. Anybody? Fear of heights? Yeah. How many fear spiders? Oh, yeah. Uh, how about fear of flying? Anybody have that? Okay. And maybe here's a couple you haven't heard about that I found out about. Dilophobia. The fear of pickles. Cholrophobia. Have you heard of that one? Cholrophobia, the fear of clowns. Some of you are like, hmm, just the mention of that word, right? But a lot of us have fear, and that fear can come out of insecurity. We're just not sure about the future. We're not sure about ourselves. We're not sure about other people. We're not sure about our job. We're not sure about marriage. We're not sure about parenting, not sure about life in general. And, and, and so uh, there's a lot of fears that we can have. And, and one fear that somebody might have today is where you stand with God. You know, do I measure up? I mean, if I was to have to stand before God today, I'm not sure how that would turn out. And, and maybe you don't feel close to God. You know, maybe, maybe you have felt closer to God than what you feel right now. Can we just acknowledge today that there are times in our lives where we feel closer to God than other times? How many honest people in church today, right? Yeah. I think that all of us can have those times that, that we feel, feel like we're closer to God than other times. And, and, and so in the midst of that, sometimes here's what happens is you come into worship and you feel like maybe there's a little voice that says, what are you doing worshiping? What are you doing raising your hands and praising the Lord and trying to get into worship today? Because everybody knows, we know that you're a hypocrite. 
We know what you did this week. We know the words you spoke this week that weren't very godly words. And the gesture that you did in the car the other day, it wasn't very <laughs> kind, you know. And uh, so you, you should just keep your hands down and you should just not even say those words that are on the screen because you're a hypocrite and you shouldn't even worship or praise the Lord. And here's what I've discovered about that is I think the enemy knows the power of my praise and worship to God. I think the enemy knows that if you get to worshiping and praising God, your fear, your uncertainties, your, your nature may take a back seat as you press into the presence of God because God inhabits the praise of his people. And when you begin to worship God, faith can begin to build and anything just might happen. And here's what I think God would say about that too, is you're, you're not worshiping me because of how great you are. You're worshiping me because of how great I am. And anytime he's worthy of me raising my hands, come on, somebody. He, he's worthy of me raising my voice and praising. I'm not praising him because I'm worthy. I'm praising him because he's worthy to receive all the glory and praise. And so on this topic today, we're going to look at some of the most unlikely people to be in the Christmas story. And it comes from Luke chapter 2. And so if you want to turn there in your Bible, it's the Christmas story that probably many of us are the most familiar with. And just set this up, Luke was a contemporary of that day and probably many Bible scholars believe had access to Mary to be able to ask her, now, how'd that happen? How did this take place? You know, and, and then he took meticulous notes, a very educated man, Luke was, and, and he wrote down all of these things so that there could be an accurate account, as he says it, of the events of Jesus coming to planet Earth. And, and so as he puts these down, I want you to know today that it brings hope for insecurities. And I wanna talk specifically about that because we can get insecure, insecure in our worship, insecure in our witness, and the enemy wants to hold us back in insecurity, but I wanna help us to break free today as we read the Christmas story together. If you found your place, Luke chapter two, if you're not not found it, it's up on the screen. Luke chapter two, verse eight says, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, and here, here's where we come into this phrase, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. Somebody say good news. good news. That will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. He says, I, I want your attention not to be on your insecurities of who you are. I want you to know who's been born. He's the Messiah. He's the Lord. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Now, here's what's amazing in this story. And here, here's the question that, that I think would come into people's minds, especially in that day when they heard this, is out of all the people that God could show up and tell the good news, his good news to for the very First time, these are first time hearers that God's going to pick and choose who this is going to be, that out of all the people on planet Earth, he picks shepherds. That would have been amazing. It would have been especially amazing in that day because you would think, and I, I would think this, that God would pick a religious person, you know, somebody spiritual, you know, like a priest, 
or, or maybe a, a scribe or a prophet or, or somebody's got like spiritual qualifications. But instead, he picks some of the most unspiritual people on the planet and has an angelic being, no less, the supernatural encounter with the living God himself to shepherds who are considered in that day to be on the lowest rung of society. I mean, these guys are, are despised. They're, 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 everybody said, hey, get away from them. They're despicable. They're despicable. And so it's incredible that out of all the people God could pick, he picks them. And so I want to give you three reasons why I think these shepherds could feel insecure. And maybe these are why you can feel insecure, even sitting in this room today. And the first one is feeling unworthy, right? Feeling unworthy. Because of the nature of their job, tending sheep, everybody said, that is disgusting. That's just a disgusting job. And, and, and so as a result, they said, you are not allowed in the temple. So they, they couldn't go to church. They, they couldn't go into the building. And here's what's ironic about that. They're rearing, they're raising, rather, the, the, the very instruments that God would use to bring a sacrifice into the temple. But they can't go into the temple. And, and so everybody would walk on the opposite side of the street. Oh, here comes a shepherd. Get on the other side. Don't let shepherd cooties get on your kids, you know. Stay away from them. They're dirty. They're filthy. And, and, and here's what the message was is you are not good enough for God. You're not good enough for God. And I want to help somebody today. I want you to know that the enemy would love nothing less than for you to feel like you're not good enough for God. Because that feeling holds you back. That feeling keeps you from going all in with God. That feeling keeps you from, from saying, oh, I'll help out in the Christmas store. I'll give in this offer. I'll, I'll make a difference with my life. I'll witness for God. No, it holds you back. That insecurity that you feel, it, it keeps you. And, and, and we can all have those kinds of feelings because here's the thing is we know what we've done. How many are glad today? We're not going to put some of that on the screen. <laughs> right? Mm, don't play that video. I know when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about something that I did as a kid. And how many know that your brain is not all the way there when you're a teenager, right? You you think it is, but but it's not. And and how I know that is by looking back, because when I was a teenager, we in youth group at church, no less, that there was a group of us that we would do things, kind of mischievous things, okay? And, and so we would, like, pick on the youth pastor in a loving kind of way. Like, like we went to, you know, um, 31 Flavors, Baskin-Robbins, right? And um, we said, hey, you got this huge stack of tubs there. Could we have those? And they said, yeah, we're just going to throw them in the trash. So we took them, hauled them, a whole bunch of them, a whole load, and stacked them in the front door area of our youth pastor's house. So it was just a wall when he went to go outside. And we would do stuff like that, just kind of, you know, poking and, and in a loving way, uh, have some fun with him. Well, one of the youth sponsors said to, to the youth pastor, he says, what you need to do, you should live out further because they won't come out here and mess with me because I live further out. Mm. See, the problem was we heard about that, right? And so we felt the duty. We felt the call, okay? The call that we needed to do something so that this guy would know his place, you know, and, and not be saying things like that. So here's what we did. We hopped him in a Jeep, and uh, we drove around, 
and we took reflectors out of people's driveways, and we just started stacking reflectors in the Jeep until we had a whole Jeep full of these re- people that's stealing. <laughs> I know that now, okay? I, but, but then it was just fun, okay? And we're doing this. But I'm thinking, I stole reflectors from somebody, and I, I didn't make it right. You know, I don't even know where they are now or any of that. But anyway, we take him out there, and we just filled his yard with reflectors so that when he drove home, it looked like the Indianapolis airport. It just <laughs> lit up at night when he came home. He didn't talk anymore, all right? So, But I thought about that, and I thought, you know, that's terrible, and, and we've all done stuff. Sometimes it's private stuff. Maybe nobody knows the history in your search engine today, but you wouldn't want them to either from this past week. Maybe uh, there's things you said to somebody or you said about somebody, and, and you wouldn't want that to be known today. Maybe there's things, places you went things you did this week that that you've kept under wraps, you hope, but it still is there. And then there's maybe public stuff, maybe the divorce that was very public, maybe the bankruptcy that everybody could read about, maybe it was uh, the, the terrible results of your child's choices that made the newspaper or, or made at least local gossip. And so whether it's public or private, we all have stuff that can make us feel unworthy. So I I can relate. How many can relate to the shepherds? That that God's going to speak to me? God's going to invade my space and speak to this person? But I want you to know today that you you don't have to feel unworthy. The other thing these guys could feel is inadequate. I mean, they were uneducated, so they were considered second class. Uh, They couldn't even testify in court, okay? So they said, well, this shepherd saw it. Well, we can't trust him. And people didn't feel like they could trust him in the marketplace. There's There's a shepherd coming this way. Take a hold of your wallet, you know. They were like lower than tax collectors. They were lower than prostitutes. People, again, would avoid them on the streets. And and, and some of us, you know, sometimes it's easy for us to compare ourselves to others. See, I remember when I had to compare myself with people I knew. Now I can compare myself to people who live in different states, through social media. I I can compare myself to people who live in different countries. I I I can just scroll and scroll and look at things and and, and then say, well, you know, that person, they seem like they are smarter than me. They know more than me. They have more facts than me. They have more money than me. They have more presence under their tree than I do. They have more friends than I do. They have more followers than I do. They have more of everything, it seems like. Or maybe this, uh, they seem more spiritual than me. You know, maybe, maybe you get intimidated by people who seem to be spiritual because they're always posting about reading the Bible, you know. And you think, wow, they just are always reading the Bible, I guess, so I, I don't measure up to that. Or they're always uh, praying, it seems like, because they say they talk about it on social media. And maybe you compare that, or in even a life group, you, you can say, well, you know, I'm not worthy or I'm inadequate to be able to pray in this life group because maybe there's somebody in your life group who seems like they're a professional prayer, you know? <laughs> they kind of went to school for it or something, and, and uh, you just don't think that you can measure up to that. And all of us have have different ways that we can feel inadequate, just like 
probably these shepherds did, but not only unworthy or inadequate, inadequate, but I think they could have felt unloved. Unloved, because people avoided them everywhere they went. Uh, They weren't welcome at church. They couldn't even go to church. They couldn't even be trusted in the marketplace. And and, and, and no family wanted them. I mean, there's no dad saying, oh, the dream for my daughter is that she would marry a shepherd. No. Said no dad ever. And, And so in the midst of all of this, you know, they felt this unworthiness, that the, being unloved. And, and, and maybe today you feel inadequate. You feel unloved. You feel undeserving. You feel like, you know, because maybe your spouse left you or you have made financial mistakes and the financial failure has even gotten out there. Or, or maybe you feel, I, I'm getting older and, and I'm still not married and still I've found that person. Am I ever going to find that person, you know? Uh, What's, what's going to happen in my life? Or you got a secret that maybe nobody knows about and, and, and you're not sharing it with anybody and it just keeps heavy on you. And, and all of those feelings can make you feel like if people knew, they wouldn't love me. If people knew everything about me, they wouldn't love me. They wouldn't like me. And all of this is, is to say that God's grace is available to all. I think the reason why God picked the shepherds out of everybody is just to prove that, watch this, I'll pick who nobody else picks. I'll choose who nobody else wants to choose. Have you ever seen God do that? I, I, I see him do it all the time. Regardless of social status, personal accomplishments, or past failures, or insecurities, I want you to know, do not disqualify us for God's grace. As a matter of fact, they qualify us for God's grace, his mercy in our lives. One of the projects that we're involved in. I just want to highlight one of those today, and and it's the one on page five in your brochure that you either have received or you could pick up before you leave today. It's about Columbia. It's the one, one of the ones Dave Ellis on the video wanted us to be a, a part of, and this is one, just a portion of what the miracle offering this year, us and many other churches, by the way, that are collecting together to make an impact in in having a difference. But in Columbia, here's where it's going. Uh, We've never done this before. It's going to a prison in Columbia. Okay, so in Columbia, here's a bunch of people in prison who maybe say, well, God would never speak to me because I have killed somebody. God could never love me because uh, I raped someone. God could never uh, come and visit me because of all the stealing that I have done. And, and you name it, all the different things that maybe cause these individuals to be incarcerated in Colombia. I want you to know there's a vibrant ministry that reaches out already to these people who are incarcerated in Colombia, and they are asking us this Christmas season to come alongside of them to help them to have an even greater impact on who would feel maybe the most unloved, most rejected, most unable to receive the grace of God, because I want you to know that the scripture says, here's what Paul said, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Aren't you glad for that? So today, if, if you're here, and I met somebody after, after first service, they say, I think I'm the number one. And you think maybe you're the number one sinner in the room. Okay, maybe you think you are. And, and you think, well, I've done all this, and I, I just, it's stuff people don't even know about me. They don't, they don't even know all the stuff about me. And I want you to know that you line all of that up, all of the sin that you've ever done in all of your lifetime, and Paul says, that's okay, because where sin abounds, and you say, oh, it abounds 
in my life, in my past, in, in my stuff that I've done, where sin abounds, good news, grace much more abounds. Can somebody get excited about that today? And it, it, it's going to do that in Colombia, and I love that, that we're going to be a part of that. But here's what the angels do. They say, you know what? We're on assignment. God said, go to shepherds. We thought we'd go to scribes. We thought we'd go to some of the upper crust. We're going to the under crust. We're going to the lowest of the low. And, and what it does, it changes these men forever because they move from insecurity to purpose. Let me, let me show it to you in the next few verses. In verse 15, when the angels had left them, they left the shepherds, gone into heaven, the, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off. Notice they didn't hang around. They didn't wait. They didn't hesitate. They hurried off and found Mary, Joseph, and the baby who was lying in a manger. The shepherds take action. I mean, I don't know why God picked us. I don't know why this angel appeared to us and told us, good news, here it is. You're the first to hear. I don't know why he did that, but I want to see it for myself. And how many know it was good news when you heard it, but it was even better news when you saw it, when you saw it activate in your own heart, in your own life, when grace came to visit you in a personal and supernatural way. And that's exactly what happens in that. And so guess what? They become the first evangelists. They become the first ones to go and tell the good news. All of our insecurities, see, try to silence us. You know, who are you to think you can go over to that person and talk to them about Jesus? Who are you to think that, that you can invite that person to church? Who are you to think that you can go share your testimony with somebody else and make a difference? I mean, who do you think you are? You're nothing special. You're a hypocrite after all. And see, all of those insecurities try to silence us because the enemy knows that when we begin to share the story, it can set the captive free. It can set people free and change their lives forever. That's the reason this Christmas season, let's fill our community with hope who doesn't need more hope? Hello? I, have you ever met anybody? No, I've got enough hope. <laughs> you know, just filled with hope. No, said nobody. We all could use a dose of hope. And God wants to use even the most unlikely people still this Christmas season, 2,000 years later, to give the message of hope to the world. And when these shepherds saw it for themselves, they could not keep it to themselves. They couldn't keep it to themselves. Look at verse 17. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, and notice, they become worshipers, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. I mean, they could not keep it 
to themselves. God has put his hope within us. I hope you're so full of hope this Christmas season that you can't keep it to yourself because you have neighbors, you have friends, you have co-workers, you have people in our community who do not have the hope that we're celebrating in this room today, that do not have the hope that we're singing about in this room today, that I'm preaching about in this room today, but there's just maybe one thing stopping them from experiencing that hope, and that's you and me. That's you and me. But hey, we can hand out these cards this week, right? Come on, somebody. We can give hope to people. We can say, hey, I want you to come. I I want you to, this Christmas season, nothing would thrill my heart but for you to sit by me in church, and and I'd love for you to hear about the reason for this time of the year and the hope that we have in Christ. And so it's good news. It's good news. And and I want to finish today by declaring this good news clearly to you. Because I I don't want anybody, here's my goal in the next few minutes, that no one would go out of this room and say, oh, my pastor... He talked about the good news at church. And somebody says, oh, well, what was the good news? And you say, well, it was the good news. <laughs> and they say, well, okay, now, what was it exactly? Well, did I not say it was the good news? It, it was good news. Go, go watch it. <laughs> you know, here's the link. Oh, you don't have to do that. I want, in the next few minutes, to share with you the good news. This is what the angels came to declare, that now good news has broken out on planet Earth. For the next 2,000 years, everything's changing because the grace and mercy and love of God is going to be on full-out display in living color in Jesus. And so, maybe you want to write this down. Here's what the good news is. It's in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. Now, here's what separates Christianity from all the other religions of the world, because it's all about doing right. And see, maybe you you were, the reason why you quit going to church is because you couldn't do right. Somebody said, you need to do right. Maybe they were spitting on you and yelling at you and everything. You're a bad person. Now let's all sing the doxology and go home. You know, and, and you just thought, oh my gosh, I'm just terrible and whatever. And, and listen, here's, here's what the fact is. We are all terrible. We all can't get right with God by doing right. You can't do enough right to make up for the wrong. Okay, because you can't live perfect. So here's what the law does. It shows how sinful we are, how, how messed up we are. But now God has shown us a way, and here's what the the, the Christmas story is about a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone. Everyone at Crossroads and everyone in a jail cell in Columbia today. It's true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. All right, that's good news. And here's three parts of this good news so you can explain it to somebody else. Law observing won't make you deserving, okay? Law observing won't make you deserving. If it could, the Pharisees would have been fine. And Jesus said, no, they're the blind leading the blind. And here was the problem. They had 613 laws to follow. That's a lot. 
613, do not do this, do not do that. You know, and I had all these rules and regulations and all. How, how many have had trouble with just the 10 that, that Moses talked about, right? Let alone 613, you know? And then Jesus comes along after Moses, and, and he breaks it down to two. And he says, well, really, when he was asked, you know, what's the most important commandment? He says, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And, now here's the one that trips a lot of us up, love your neighbor as yourself. Hmm. How many are still working on those? <laughs> still working on that. And, and that's just two. And, and, and so what he says is, is we, by observing the law, I, I can't even keep the two commandments, let alone the 10 commandments, let alone 610 commandments. So what's it about? In, in verse 20 again, he says, no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. You cannot get to God by living perfect because you are not perfect. You just can't do it. That's why a lot of us feel like we don't measure up because we're trying, trying to measure up. And here's what the second thing he talks about here is the law simply reveals need. It, it simply reveals the need. In verse 20, he says, the law simply shows us how sinful we are. It shows us how jacked up we really are. Like, love the Lord your God with everything. Okay, well, my TV got in the way this week. My love for money got in the way this week. My pride got in the way. Hello, somebody? That's just that part. Love your neighbor as yourself until I don't like my neighbor right? And, and so he says, you, you, you can't do that. Let me just put it to a test today. How many, come on, you're in church. How many have ever fudged something, didn't quite tell it right, stretched the truth, whatever? How many have ever lied before? Yeah. And um, how many of you have ever taken something that did not, it could have been a reflector, <laughs> um, could have been whatever, but, but you took something that didn't belong to you and you took it. How many have ever done that? Took something. Maybe on income taxes, didn't quite put it all down <laughs> on paper there, you know. How many of you, now uh, we're going to go how Jesus talked about this. How many of you have ever looked at an image or something, someone, a person, a human, whatever, and, and you lusted after that person? Jesus said if you, if you lusted after them, uh, you, in, you, you have committed adultery. So how many have ever lusted before? Okay, not quite as many hands because some of you are sitting by your spouse, and I understand that. So, all right. But, but here's the thing. You are sitting around a bunch of lying, thieving, adulterous people today in church at Crossroads. Welcome to Crossroads, all right? But here's what Paul says about this. If you don't see yourself as a sinner, you won't see your need for a Savior. And see, what, what, this, what this book helps me to know is, oh, I need you, God. I need you. I'm not enough. I, I can't ever be enough. I can't measure up. I, I need you in my life. And that's what those commandments do. They help me to know how much I need Jesus in my life. Let, let me tell you something. You don't need religion. You need a Savior, right? You need a Savior, and the Savior has come. Here's, here's the last thing is 
Only faith in Christ alone makes us right with God. Only, that's the only thing. And I'm so glad that it's this way uh, because, well, let me read it to you. Here's what he says in verse 22. He says, we're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who they are. I'm so glad that there aren't 619 ways to God. Somebody says, well, that, you know, that just seems narrow-minded to say there's only one way to God. No, it's not narrow-minded. It's simple. That's what it is. It just, it doesn't complicate it. Because I don't know about you, if I thought there were 10 ways to God, I would want to know, but yeah, but what's the best one? What's the best way? And see, God took all the confusion out of it. He, he, he just boiled it down and says, let's just make it simple. Instead of you figuring out, which is all the world religions today, of how to get to God. Oh, you crawl on your knees in this direction. Oh, you pray in this direction. Oh, you pray at certain times of the day, and you've got to do that. Oh, you have to fulfill this. Oh, you have to go to this place. Oh, you have to give this offering. Oh, you have to give this. You have to do this. Do, 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 do. And in Instead, Christianity is, no, you don't do anything. He did it for you. He accomplished it for you. How many know that's good news today? Such good news. Jesus was born of a virgin. This is the Christmas story. Jesus was born without sin so that he could be the ultimate sacrifice for us, the lamb sent from God, not our lamb to him, not our way of trying to reach up to him, but instead he came down to our level when we couldn't get up to his. He was born on this earth as a human so he could live and die for us, but also be raised from the dead to fill us with hope that it's not about you, it's all about him. And I get excited about that, all right? Because just like these guys, they felt unworthy. Who am I that God should speak to me? I'm unworthy, I'm unpolished. And these guys were unremarkable. They were uneducated. They, they were like the least of the least. And what God is saying from the very beginning of the Christmas story, Luke tells us, is yes, that's who God goes to. He'll go to the uppermost and the undermost. It doesn't make any difference where you are in life. He came for you. See, Christianity is all about a relationship of what God has done for us. And here's what he wanted the world to know. No one is too far from him. No one is too far from God's reach. No one is too low for God's love. No sin is too great for God's grace. That's the good news. It's good news because it's not about you. It's all about him. And I believe today there's some people here that you need to personally receive that good news because maybe you thought it was about what you could do for God. No, it's what he did for you already. He already did it. Now, all you've got to do is by faith activate it in your life. And when you do, just like these shepherds were changed and transformed by a personal encounter they said, we need to see it for ourselves. We need to experience it for ourselves. And here's what my hope is for you, that you will experience it for yourself today. And if you do, you'll know what God's grace can do in a person's life from the inside out. Let's pray. Father, help us today to have the courage to overcome every insecurity in our lives through you so that you can use us. God, 
We know the enemy wants us to hold back and to be incarcerated by our own insecurities, our fears, our inhibitions. But Lord, we want to just raise our hands and boldly worship you. We want to boldly witness for you. We want to tell other people about the good news. We want to walk in our purpose and change the world. Maybe you're here today and you say, Craig, I don't want any insecurities on my end to hold me back from being all God wants me to be, especially in this month of December. I want God to use me to reach people, to touch people, to, to maybe this Saturday, maybe it's this week, maybe it's tomorrow at the break room at, at work, or maybe it's school this week, wherever you go, that, that God's going to use your life. You're not going to let insecurity hold you back. That's your prayer today. Will you raise your hand all over this room? Come on, church. Let's, let's let God use us this month. Father in heaven, we lay our insecurities at your feet. We know we don't measure up, but that's the whole point. You make us worthy. You come into our lives. And just like you use these shepherds, God, you can use anyone here at Crossroads today. Anyone watching online, you, you, you can invade our space, come into our lives just like you did with the shepherds and, and turn us around and make us more than we ever thought we could be because of your mighty power and your grace working in our lives. And God, we just say, God, if you can use anything this month of December, especially, God, would you just use us to bring change to our community, to our county, to our neighbors, to those around us? May you use us, God, to have an impact on the world around. Maybe you're here today, others of you, in this Christmas story, uh, highlights to you that, that could that be me? Could, could God actually want to invade my space and in, into my life, my heart, my life, and, and meet me where I am, just like those shepherds, just like in all their sin and all their mistakes and all of the, all of the mess, God stepped into their lives. And today, God wants to step into your life. And if you're here this morning, maybe the whole reason why you're here this morning is so God can step into your life like he did with those shepherds and show his power, his grace in and through your life. And if you say, if that's true, Craig, if, if that's true and, and what you just talked about, I want it to happen to me. I want it to happen in my life. If that's you today and you need God's grace in your life, you want God to start working in your life, would you just raise your hand all over this room? Just raise it up. Say, yeah, yeah, that's me. That's me. Just raise it up. And online, just type the word decided in the chat. The word decided, and we're going to be praying for you. As a matter of fact, let's everybody pray so that everyone around us will pray, especially those who raise their hand. Say, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to not just be a baby in a manger, but to die on a cross for me. And I believe through his death, he paid for all my sin. So today I accept that sacrifice to make me worthy to come before you right now. Will you wash away my past? Make me a new person from this day forward as much as I know how. I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, somebody, let's celebrate those who made Jesus the Savior of their lives. Listen, there are words that you can text as a next step right from where you are. And uh, just take that next step of whatever that is for you. Could be baptism, could be joining a small group, could be getting into growth track, whatever that is. In person, listen, you can just go across the hall because we got a next steps room over here and one of our elders would be glad to talk to you about your next step with God. I'm gonna ask our prayer partners to come forward at this time. The rest of us, let's stand together. I'm gonna pray a prayer over you today. Come on, let's take the hope of Jesus 
out of this place. Let, let's take the hope of Jesus to those around us. And if you need prayer for any reason, listen, don't let anything hold you back from coming and receiving the prayer that you need. Father, we thank you for the power of hope. And we ask that you'll just go with us out of this place. Help us to change those around us by telling the story of hope. It's all about you, God. It's not about us. It's not what we've done. It's what you've done for us. And today we celebrate that in this place, the good news. We want to spread it all around. Holy Spirit, draw every person who needs prayer down here to the front to receive the prayer that they need. And God, do miracles here yet today. And we believe for it in Jesus' name. Amen.